Hello, everyone. Welcome to our COOP live stream today brought to you by ARCS. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I work for ARCS, and I'm just going to give you a few quick technical notes before we start. There is a slight delay between we are actually doing our recording and when it's getting pushed out to YouTube, so just be aware of that. And the other bit of this is that this is an interactive live stream. So if you want to, feel free to comment away in the chat box, the actual YouTube chat box, and we'll be sure to monitor it during the talk. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic over to Becca Kennedy. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural program by the ARCS Emergency Subcommittee. The committee has been charged with the um, charge to develop and implement emergency preparedness and response training and create platforms for resource sharing for registrars and collection specialists. The committee looks forward to sharing more programs and training with you all in the future. I am Rebecca Kennedy, Chair of the ARCS Emergency Subcommittee and moderator, moderator of today's panel discussion. As the pandemic has continued to spread and negatively impact museums and cultural institutions, we have seen the constant call for implementation of continuity of operations or COOP. A COOP is the ability to continue to ensure your primary mission is met regardless of crisis, disasters, and other disruptions. The continuity plan is used as a roadmap for the implementation and management of all continuity operations. This is a simple business practice and all institutions should have one. But today we are going to address how collection specialists and registrars should involve themselves in COOP planning and highlight some areas of criteria that should consider when discussing essential functions, vital management, facilities control, and much more. However, we encourage you all to learn more about the interest and more about COOP through resources that will be provided. I will now briefly introduce our amazing panelists who are so kind to be with us today and are willing to answer the questions that you may have on this difficult topic. So we have with us today, uh, Elena Gregg, who is the Emergency Programs Coordinator for the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation. Robin Long, Director of Security and Custodial Services at Newfields. Anne Young, Director of Legal Affairs and Intellectual Property at Newfields. Eric Fisher, Senior Vice President for Willis Towers Watson Fine Art, and Becky Feifeld, Head of Collections Management at New York Public Library. So we will um, uh, take live questions. So please put them in the chat box of the live feed. But to start everyone off, and this is a question for everyone, how should you start writing a coop related to your area of expertise? And who should be involved in that process? Any takers? Elena, why don't we start with you or Becky? Okay. Um, I think that the beginning process for COOP should involve really somebody from every department of your institution, um, just to get everybody's opinion and perspective represented. Um, I think that as a collections professional, we often think about the collection and we're engrossed in the collections needs, um, but having people that are coming at this issue from different perspectives, such as facilities and security and, um, you know, your learning engagement department, um, they're able to identify gaps that you might not see yourself right away. Um, and then I also think that identifying first your risks and your hazards, um, your vulnerabilities, and then kind of seeing where your, like what your core capabilities need to be, that can set a foundation for building onto COOP. Becky, do you have something you wanted to add? Sure. I think a lot of us are often, um, you know, we might struggle just based on where we sit in the institution or um, maybe just a lack of momentum about how to get started with, with COOP. And I think that some really um, strong strategies are, you know, reaching out, you know, finding other interested parties, such as what Elena just talked about, you know, who are other people whose operations might be really affected by business interruption or who have a natural interest. I'm thinking about people who run your IT systems, um, people uh, who um, health and safety facilities, 
even public programs, you know, and you can start with a talking campaign. You can come up and you can say, so what would happen to your operations if we had a fire in this area? Or what would happen to your operations if we had a hurricane that closed us for a week or two? I think those are really strong strategies for getting people thinking. Right. So what does it take, Becky, while we have you, how can we get collections managers and registrars to be at the table when it comes to planning for a coop? So I, uh, just to like maybe share a little of my um, experience where I'm coming from, I've had to be the registrar uh, collection management professional um, being at, yeah, in a, um, not a leadership position in a large organization, but have to build um, momentum and interest and involvement. And a lot of my messaging involved, um, how am I supposed to do my job in this area when we don't have a larger program? Um, also revealing areas that may not be covered by current coop planning, um, such as, um, you know, reputational risks, you know, how do we report about the collections and security of collections um, in this kind of business interruption environment, um, insurers, and I'll, I'll leave the insurance talk to the insurance professionals here, <laughs> but um, how do we um, communicate with our insurers? And, you know, these are all messages that I think we do um, draw in the collection and registrars um, professionals into that conversation. And again, I think, you know, just continuing to pepper your colleagues, everybody, talk to everybody about this. And I think that shows you to be a really strong partner in, in uh, coup planning. Great, thank you. Um, you bring up great points about creating this communication between not only internal, but the external work of collections managers and registrars. And I think, um, turn this over to Anne and Robin, if you both could talk about what is it like to work with facilities and security who are remaining on site. And Robin, from your standpoint, what do you wish the collections uh, staff had communicated with you in a clearer fashion? And how could that have been done? Well, for us, I am still on site. Um, sorry if you hear my radio in the background, but they have left us with, I mean, they have really given us a lot of information. They created a document hotspots around the museum. So when, when we do have heavy rains or power outages, there's a document that the registration department has given us that we have been having that shows us the areas to check. So we're familiar with these areas, but this document is very detailed. So I can say they did leave us with a lot of information. Uh, we do daily inventories of the gallery still uh, every day of the week, even though they're not here. So I just feel like our registration department really has given us the tools and the information that we need to, uh, the humidity, the, the temperature in certain areas, our storage archives, that's checked daily as well. Uh, three or four times a day. So I just feel like those departments, archives, registration really has given us the tools. And we also have facilities on site and they're here with us as well. So if we have any interruptions with the humidity or temperature, they're here to assist us with that. Great. Anne, do you have anything to add? Um, I think the biggest thing I would add is just kind of, um, talking about this, that anything with COOP really starts with having it step back and really going through exercises such as taking on, like looking at an overall enterprise risk management assessment for your institution and really figuring out, you know, what are your potential risks, outlining those, and then working to develop what a COOP will be for those potential different situations. Um, you know, and I think it is one of those that having that cross-departmental buy-in is absolutely key to the success of that. Having regular meetings, and so for us at Newfield, that's regular meetings of our safety committee um, that's cross-departmental, um, a number of departments involved, and everybody is able to bring something a little bit different. And often there will be things that, you know, one department hasn't thought of and how that could impact overall continuity of operations. Um, 
and I think it's important to really think about this in terms of what does that continuity mean? Is it something that affects every facet of your organization, uh, such as what many of us are dealing with in the current situation, or is it a risk that affects one portion of it? Um, and maybe really only affects a few things. So, you know, what we're going through currently with the pandemic affects us differently than a fire to one particular area or a power outage or a flood or leak in one particular area. Uh, those all kind of have a, a different level and what how we have to respond and what that means for our team. Great, thank you. So Eric, as somebody in insurance who the collections and registration staff should be reaching out to, um, has anything changed with insurance policies that of how we should be communicating with you better in coop planning? Yeah, I mean, I think going forward, there's gonna be have to be a lot more sharing of information. I mean, no one in their minds could have predicted, you know, a nationwide lockdown. Um, and so, you know, traditionally we would have one or two contacts within an institution. Now I think that more people are gonna to have to know who their brokers are and what their roles are and how they can be contacted. Um, and numbers more than just the office number uh, in cases of emergencies. Uh, in the short term, there hasn't been a lot of change uh, to collections policies. This really isn't a, you know, a physical property type of, of, of event, um, but going forward, uh, People are gonna see virus and pandemic exclusions attached to the policy, uh, just to be sure. A lot of museums have event cancellation coverage on their policies and uh, underwriters are gonna be very specific going forward that uh, these type of events are not gonna be covered. It's, it's a physical loss. It's not a, uh, a, you know, a shutdown of the institution, um, but it, it's gonna be really interesting. Um, a lot of states are pushing for this to be classified as a physical loss. And if that is the case, then insurers are gonna have a very difficult time excluding it. Uh, just this morning, I was reading that uh, there might be a nationwide response to this similar to terrorism after 9-11. After 9-11, the banks were refusing to lend uh, to companies that didn't have terrorism insurance. So they created the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, TRIA. Um, and so going forward, are banks going to lend to uh, companies that don't have business interruption coverage that would cover a pandemic uh, and insurers are trying to exclude it. Uh, there has to be some kind of solution and it may be a federal backstop very similar to what happened uh, with the terrorism. It's going to be a very interesting time in insurance going forward. Does this make any changes for loans that are outstanding or loans that were in transit when the pandemic happened? I mean, uh, most of what we've been doing over the last two months is extending coverage uh, for exhibitions that were out on the road. Uh, you know, people are not able to get uh, their loans back in a, in a timely manner. Uh, so, you know, loan agreements are being changed, certificates of insurance, the dates are being changed. Um, you know, exhibition riders have been extended, uh, but it's, um, it's gonna be really interesting to see um, how much exhibition activity is going to happen going forward, knowing that there is a, a very good chance that this may come back again. Great, thanks. So one of the big questions I think probably on everyone's mind and uh, probably start with Becky, but I'd like for all of you to weigh in is what should collection professionals do if they are not deemed essential during this pandemic or any future crisis? How can, you know, after the fact, we get a seat at the table and become considered an essential function, which an essential function determination is a very important aspect of COOP. I think it's important in all of your messaging to create that visual hole at the table, you know, what is not getting covered in COOP if, if you are not there and if your voice isn't being shared. So I think that's an important part. Um, I you know, have, so in, in my experience, so I led, um, I was involved with Alliance for Response New York City for six years and three of those I was chair. And then I've led two major organizations in collections emergency preparedness and was involved in business continuity planning for, for one of them. And so much of this is a, is a 
They find that uh, tabletop, I'm, I'll call them tabletops for now, but it's just even one sentence scenarios are so, so effective for creating, painting, painting that visual picture of you, you being at the table and you contributing to that, to that effort. I think we know that um, emergency preparedness works best in institutions with true believers, <laughs> you know, people who are really passionate and committed to the exercise. Um, and, um, and I think that leaders, leaders find that appealing. So um, they can find a true believer, certainly among, among us. Um. Anyone else have any opinions on what would make a, how you foresee getting collections people to the table as an essential function? Um, I think in terms of um, deeming collections essential from the viewpoint of emergency management, I think it is highly beneficial when um, you approach your county or state um, emergency management office and kind of make a case for how it can be a mutually beneficial arrangement, so to speak, um, just because by providing concrete evidence that you are essential to your community in terms of bringing tourists in and stimulating the local economy, um, as well as providing, I mean, historic resources for generations to come, um, and by providing uh, kind of avenues for how you can help them, that creates uh, like a communal sense of respect where they are going to loop you into their coop planning as well. Um, speaking from a personal perspective, uh, just I, I used to work at the Sky Museum and Gardens as their collections care specialist. We developed a really close relationship with the Miami-Dade County Emergency Operations Center and their Office of Emergency Management. And um, we were able to secure a seat within their EOC. Um, and in doing that, we were representing the Alliance for Response for South Florida, but we were also representing their emergency support function for business and industry. So by playing into their role, which was representing Publix and other box stores, pharmacies, gas stations, we also were allowed to kind of like coordinate response for a network of cultural institutions. So if you create sort of like a, a give and take situation, they will see your point of view. They're not going to see it unless you explicitly say, this is what we can provide and this is how we can do that. Let's work together. Elena, would you elaborate a little bit on, um, you didn't say this, but I'm, in, I'm insinuating it from what you were saying, the uh, incident command structure and how that phases in to establishing essential functions and you know, would you recommend the ICS training? Explain what ICS is and yeah, so okay. and how that goes into COOP. Yeah, um, so the incident command system is a flexible system structure that is used by governmental agencies, um, by anybody who wants to kind of have an organized structure in place to respond um, it can be to a storm or a large event such as the Super Bowl, Super Bowl or uh, like a graduation ceremony, anything that requires many parts working together to have a cohesive response can use ICS. Um, at Vizcaya, we adopted ICS and many institutions have done this as well to fit a museum structure. So um, the basic tenets of incident command system are that you have a planning section, logistics, operations, and finance. Um, and then within the incident command, which is the, the leader of your response, um, you have communications, your liaison officer, and then your safety and security person. So um, for a museum system, we adopted that and made like a salvage and triage team, um, a documentation assessment team, um, trying to think three weeks out and it's already half of my brain. Um, but um, it, it's super helpful because that kind of sets your groundwork and foundation for response. Um, I think that for many cultural organizations, it's difficult because the sense of overwhelm that comes with having your preparedness in check kind of seems abstracted. And until you have a foundation in place, 
it almost seems like too much to get started. But once you just put your system in place, which can be creating a plan or a structure based off of ICS, you're able to build from there and it seems more tangible and more approachable in a sense. Um, so I think for continuity of operations, it's helpful because you're able to say what your essential functions are, um, which when you get into a situation that requires coop, you can just divert to that process instead of having to kind of come up with it in real time, if that makes sense. Am I making sense by that? <laughs> yes, like you I'm do. <laughs> the, the incident command system is quite complex, and but it is something you need to understand in order to incorporate into your coop. And as uh, Samantha Forsco put into the chat box, one of the great books is Implementing the Incident Command Systems at the Institutional Level by David Carmichael. And it's great and um, definitely something that every institution should be looking into to help moving forward with COOP planning. Um, Becky, you wanted to add something? Yeah, in addition to understanding ICS and, and really, you know, so much of this is everybody knowing what their role is right when when uh, you shift to this, you know, um, right when you shift into um, continuity of operations, but also just trying to get a, a museum, a library, a cultural institution to think through COOP is, um, can be really an eye-opening experience for leadership. So um, when I was at the Met, we did come business continuity training. We did 70 different departments. And you know, the business department's very, very used to thinking this way, like how do we continue payroll? Um, uh, you know, what do we do with donations, et cetera, like that. But also um, sometimes when you hit the curatorial departments, they, they're not used to thinking this way. So training is really essential in, in just you know, getting them to one, figure out what's their critical files, what are their critical processes, who are their critical people. And then also like, if you have a fire or you can't get back to your desk tomorrow, what projects of yours are gonna be disrupted um, if you can't get back to there? So that can help them visualize like what exhibition were you working on? What's on your desk? When everybody gets together around Coop, you know, and can see their part of it, it really helps. It was a real eye opener too. Like, you know, the photo studio said, well, oh, if we have a flood, we have all these flash packs in our photo studio. And that's a huge, you know, huge electrical hazard. And we're like, oh, okay. So we learned a lot through that exercise. Thanks. Great example. So there's several layers to coop planning and one or a coop and one is planning. And after that, you then have to go into training with a coop and then testing it. And one of the areas of training that we've seen a lot of holes in is um, training facilities and security staff to essentially do what um, Robin was saying that her staff has found very helpful was information from um, the registrar's office. But I wanted to ask Robin, did your staff go under, go through any training with the collections management or registrar staff to know how to use these check sheets or was it just given to you? and what would have been most helpful? Well, part of our security training is checking the building anyway. So once they gave us that document, we knew what to look for as far as leaks. Um, like I said, hot spots in the galleries, what, when it, heavy rains, we know exactly where to go in art storage and see if we have any issues coming from those areas. So with them providing that for us, like I said, we, we check the building top to bottom every single door. So we're looking for these things anyway, and we notify facilities of a lot of building issues that we may have as well. So when they provided that for us, it was just another layer of the, of the security and checkpoints that we do throughout the building. So, but in those particular art storage, exhibition holding, archives, the document really laid out, and it's a visual document as well, arrows, circles, I mean, telling you exactly where to look in all these areas. So that gave us another layer to look for as we're checking the building and our outbuildings as well. That, that's really great. I wish every institution did that. Who was responsible for creating that document and disseminating it to you? I believe it was Sherry Peglo in our registration department. That's who I received it from. I don't know who actually created the whole document, but I believe it was Sherry Peglo. Okay, great. 
Um, Eric, you got a you got a question shout out. Um, if if the organizations and institutions create a coop, and that essentially reduces risk to the institution, would that have any effect on the insurance? I'd like to say yes, but not really. I mean, the, the rates that museums pay now are as low as they've ever been. Uh, and the market was actually starting to, it was called pardon uh, right before this started, which means that across the board, the market was looking for increases in premium. Uh, and it really had nothing to do with museum losses. It was more uh, market losses, uh, state of the economy. Uh, there's cycles of hardening and it's soft market is when it's really inexpensive. Um, but just to give you, a, for instance, the rates now are a quarter of what they were 25 years ago. And there's really not a lot of room to, to get much less expensive, uh, especially since the values of, of works of art continue to rise. But in a hard market, you, you want to have a good loss record. You want to have procedures in place to mitigate any type of loss uh, that you can show to underwriters so you're not as impacted uh, when the rates increase. Um, if you talk to other people within your institutions and you talk to them about the other types of property insurance uh, and workers' comp insurance, I mean, those rates have gone up significantly in the last two years, whereas the collections rates have remained relatively flat or a very modest increase. Uh, with what's going on now, uh, we're seeing kind of a, a retraction of asking for increases, um, but it's still something that can go forward. Um, and if the economy really is significantly impacted this by this long term, uh, rates could actually go up as your revenue stream uh, goes down. Um, and it's uh, you know it, it's it's going to be a very interesting time. No one knows for sure what's going on. Uh, but you know, even like where I work, uh, we're finding that working from home is actually working out well. So our need as a company for commercial real estate is gonna go down. And a big driver of premium in the property insurance market is the commercial real estate. So if they are having struggles, uh, insurers are looking for premium in other places. Uh, because the rates are so low, underwriters do expect a, a certain level of uh, protection for your for your institutions and uh, you know these types of plans uh, disaster plans uh, you know really help keep those rates down and help uh, reduce any type of impact uh, on any type of price increase going forward. That's good to know. Um, do you have any opinion on what we could put in a coop going forward that would make life for the insurance companies working with cultural institutions easier? Just to make that a very tough question. I mean, and again, going back to what I said earlier, is it's going to be a lot more of sharing of information. Uh, you know, in the past, you know, it's we've just asked, you know, do you have a disaster plan? Do you have a plan uh, to relocate and, you know, to continue your operations going forward? And beyond that, we didn't really pursue it all that much. I think uh, going forward, it's something underwriters are going to ask for a little more information. Uh, you know, not only do you need to share your insurance contact names with a broader spectrum of people within your institution, uh, but I think that your insurance brokers and agents are going to want to know more people to contact if something does happen. Uh, we may want to know the phone number of security, which we typically don't ask for on a regular basis, but it is something uh, that, you know, it, it's going to be a different world. And again, we're going to ask, there's going to be a lot more sharing of information going forward. Great. Do you have um, a checklist that you all ask the same questions from in the past that you're editing now? I mean, typically, I mean, when we underwrite a, a museum risk, we ask for the facilities report. Um, you know, uh, but we're seeing more and more insurance companies are sending in their loss control people. Uh, and they have a separate listing. And one of the things that they do talk about is disaster planning and continuity planning. Um, and, you know, going in, in, instead of just being a, a box that's checked off, they may ask for a copy of, of those going forward. So if something on, on this large a scale happens again and there is concerns, uh, you know, they know who to contact. Uh, we know who to contact, uh, you know, our, you know, 
are the institutions being locked down correctly? We haven't heard from anybody, you know, who do we contact to make sure? And it may not be the registrar. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of our contacts being furloughed uh, going forward. So, you know, who do we contact from that point going forward? Um, it's, it's uh, yeah, again, it's, it's gonna be a lot of sharing of information that, that we haven't asked for in the past. Great, thank you. That's a lot of tough questions for you with a lot of unknowns, I think, no. going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's the problem is that you just don't know. Um, right. And the market, you know, you know, if a lot of businesses go out of business, then uh, underwriters aren't gonna be able to ask for more premium uh, because there's going to be competition. People are going to be, underwriters are going to be looking to put lost business on the books. And so it may head off any type of hardening of the market. Uh, but so it's, you know, there's new players getting into the market, companies emerging. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of activity going on. It just leaves so many unknowns and it's, it's unpredictable, which is a very uncomfortable position to be in uh, where we've been able to, to pretty much gauge uh, over the last uh, 25 years, uh, what was going on. So after uh, an event like Katrina or Sandy, you know, we know where price increases were coming and where they weren't. But now it's, it's, it's across the whole spectrum and we just uh, are having a hard time gauging of what the impact is gonna be. Uh, as people ask, uh, you know, for estimates for exhibitions in 2021, 2022, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to plan. Uh, that far in advance with, with so many unknowns out there. Thanks. And I think if there's a lot of questions related to insurance, we should definitely tune in to the insurance ARCS chat that's happening next week because, um, you know, we're trying to stay on the focus of, of COOP, how it affects COOP a little bit today. Um, so one of the bigger questions that I definitely want to um, make sure we're clear on, because after you've gone through the planning, and you're starting to do the training and you're starting to do the um, simulations and the and the scenario testing, how important is it to, and Elena mentioned this, to um, talk to city and state emergency managers, but how important is it to incorporate them in your scenarios as you run them and in your trainings? Elena, if you wanna take that or anybody else. Robin, you as well, maybe, since you also work in this field. Yeah, it's, it's very important. I think that um, especially if, well, speaking again from Vizcaya's perspective, the entire structure is part of the collection. So if there is an incident and um, first responders need to enter the site, if every floor wall ceiling is a protected surface, they need to know that that's, you know, they're going to do their best to respond. But if they can have that baseline awareness of maybe don't throw my bag against the wall sort of thing, then it just builds, a, again, just like mutual respect. Um, and I think also on that same vein, um, when considering uh, like having disaster recovery vendors, um, we were considering a few different vendors uh, just to have on retainer in the event of a storm, specifically hurricanes. Um, but having them come on site and see your site and be aware and accustomed to what the needs are and what the different sensitivities surrounding the collection are, um, that's also incredibly helpful. It's also just, I mean, when you're training staff, when you're training first responders, anybody having that muscle memory and knowing what to expect, you just kind of can go into autopilot and reduce your, reduce your ability to damage anything. So it, I think it's beneficial from multiple fronts to engage them in your training. And I would say we haven't had any, we were in the process of like having the fire department do a walkthrough of our building. We have not done that yet. Uh, we did take them out on, on our grounds. We have 152 acre, acres. So the 52 acres, our main campus, we did do an outside walkthrough with the uh, fire department. But we were in talks of having them and walking them through our building, our service level, our galleries. So if something did happen, they would know. I mean, hopefully we'll have a, a security person with them. If, but if not, 
letting them know the building and like you said, not tearing up anything that they shouldn't. So we were in that process. We have not done that yet, but that is on our to-do list to have the fire department come out so we can show them you know, what our building looks like on the inside because a lot of them haven't been inside. So it's it's when we have emergencies, they'll, they'll come to the front area and that's really it. So that is what our safety manager, he that was on our books to, to, do, to do that. Not sure when we're gonna get to it again, but that is something we are planning to do in the future. So it's probably as a lot of people can tell, there's a lot of crossover in the conversation between developing an emergency plan and developing a coop. And that's not a coincidence. They do actually feed directly into each other. So if you have an emergency plan, you can translate this into why you are an essential personnel when there is a long-term closure, no matter what that is, because th this is still in an emergency situation, just a very long-term. Um, but I just wanted to, you know. Rebecca, can I jump in real quick? Please do. I do not like talking this much. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and another thing too is if you're looking for a seat at the table and you're getting pushed back from your institution, that's when you bring in your collections insurance people. Uh, they are a stakeholder as well. And they want to know that you are there. You're involved in the, you know, the essential operation uh, of your institution going forward. Uh, you know, a lot of times what we do is when we do loss control is we will ask the registrars and collections managers, is there anything you want in this report that you've always wanted to say? Because now it's coming from a third party. Uh, it's the insurance company. It's a critical part of your risk management portfolio. And they're saying, hey, these people need to be involved as well. So don't be afraid to, to reach out to whoever you're, you're working with uh, and bring them in if you feel that uh, your voice is important. Great. Becky, did you want to add something? I'm riding various waves and, you know, <laughs> um, one thing I'd like to bring up that doesn't always come up with um, coop planning uh, is always considering um, who your vendors are that you're dependent on and what their emergency planning um, is like. This is something that we host an Alliance for Response New York City um, uh, program many years ago, but we had the um, the emergency coordinator for Con Ed, which is the power company in the New York City area, come and talk to us about emergency preparedness. And one of the things he brought up was checking with all of your vendors to see what kind of emergency preparedness um, plans and coop plans they have in place. So for museums, you know, what happens if, let's say, you use a transportation company to get people to your site, you know, or get around your site, or do you have collections that are out getting digitized and what are what are their emergency preparedness plans? So a lot of times our, our preparedness needs to go beyond our own doors to make sure that um, we weather threats well. Um, Anne, you have been instrumental in the reopening and reentry of your institution. Um, can you talk about how you got so involved and what that has looked like and why you are so powerful? <laughs> um, well, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, actually just shortly before all of this um, occurred, I actually had, had joined our uh, safety committee um, as its uh, one, its co-chair, um, and really working through and with them on, you know, risk management and just you know keeping an eye on everything. As my role has changed, um, and and as being director of legal affairs, kind of taking on a broader, um, having a broader pulse of things, um, just for overall risk mitigation. Um, and so, kind of as part of that, when we had to, you know, we started making plans and realizing things were coming and trying to be proactive, anticipating that we would be closing. Um, and we went through all of our closing stages much faster than we anticipated moving through those that we had planned for. Um, and then starting to make the plans thinking about reopening and really stepping back, lots and lots of research on what reopening scenarios can look like, but really taking it and reverse engineering the closing scenarios and stages that we took. Um, and so really kind of thinking through this um, 
with our, so we have a um, ops team uh, that we put together for disaster response now uh, that meets very regularly and working really closely with that team to develop this and really think about what does it look like to step through um, this and kind of reverse engineer how we ended up closing uh, the museum, our overall campus, all of our outbuildings. Uh, for us, that also meant closing um, and shuttering the um, Miller House and Garden uh, that's an offsite location for us away from the main campus and ceasing tours there as well, which of course then, uh, Becky, to your point, and working with different vendors, coordinating with, you know, uh, the uh, Visitor Services Center in Columbus, Indiana that manages tours of that house on our behalf. So coordinating with them, coordinating with our uh, catering company um, that manages our on-site cafe, you know, all, all of these vendors. Um, and so, and then now keeping a really close contact with them. Um, and of course, Becca, working with you to try to think about these different scenarios and how we could look at what reopening can look like for the institution and going any type of business continuity that most of the time, particularly for us, where as Robin mentioned, we have 152 acres, we have an art park, we have two different historic homes, we have a 52 acre garden, and we have the art museum. And so having a lot of different things that a lot of cultural institutions maybe have one of those things or maybe two of those things. And so we've had a lot of different things and really going, you know, these plans that we were thinking about towards reopening in different stages and going, okay, how can we get to a stage where we can reopen the garden and the park and reopen the museum and the historic homes at a later stage? And what are the triggers from the local state and or national level that would allow us to move into these different reopening scenarios? So really trying to step it back, think bigger picture um, through all of this. Um, and I do, another thing I wanna um, kind of point out in thinking about either a closure or moving into a reopening, but anything with your business continuity, another thing uh, aside from you know, your vendors and your insurance to be careful and aware of, uh, the other thing is working with uh, legal counsel and reviewing your con contracts and agreements and making sure you have force majeure in your agreements making sure that your force majeure clause includes pandemic now, making sure that your force majeure clause also does not include unreasonable thresholds for either party to have to meet in order to claim force majeure of a situation. Um, and which, you know, things where I've seen some of these clauses where it'll say, you know, unable to, you know, complete the, you know, services under this agreement and it has to be, you know, all possible ability to achieve this. And it's like, okay, so what does that actually mean to, have, you know, you've extended this and it's beyond any ability to do it instead of it just being force majeure is just something that was out of everyone's control and nobody could have expected. Um, and so I think that that's a clause that a lot of times is looked at by people as, legalese and we don't know what it quite what it means and do we really need this in this contract and now a lot of people are we're looking at contracts and we're going how did this get through without that and now we're stuck and if you don't have a clause like that and you're in a situation where you need to you know you're, you're not able to move forward with an event or your or contract for whatever reason and if you don't have that force majeure clause then you're just looking at whatever cancellation or termination uh, governs that overall agreement too. So sorry, I know that was a little aside, but no, it's okay. It looks like the 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 audience liked it, so you're you're good. Uh, but no, that was a very helpful input. And you know, most people don't think about the legal language of their documents as they're going through this process. So I think it was really important to bring up. But you know, also getting together a group to handle all this means again deciding who those emer uh, who those support functions are and who is essential. So it, this is all would be much cleaner and we wouldn't have to be uh, going through so much panic now if these were had been decided in advance, which is part of that planning aspect of COOP. Uh, Robin, you got a question. How frequently should you have um, first uh, those on-site visits from emergency response personnel? I think once a year. Um, 
if that, it's we usually ask the question to the fire department. We did have them come out and we were telling them the things that we're doing. We're sitting that some captains came out and told them some things we had in place and they said we were right on track. So that was really good to hear. And that was, I've been in this role for the director for four years now and that was a couple of years ago they came out. So I think it's really, they will come out as much as you want them to. And, you know, IMPD was the same way if they needed to come to our campus for any active intruder, they will come out as much as you would like them to. They do like that engagement. So you would just have to reach out to your local uh, fire department or police department and set up something um, to me once a year or for them to have your campus. And then they'll give you some, some feedback on how often you, they should come and uh, look at the campus. We, uh, Butler University is really close to us. And the chief over there was in uh, the police department for 40 years. So when I have questions about when we put metal detectors in place and questions about active intruder, he was very um, open and he came over and we had lunch and any question I had, he was, he was, at, he was answering it for me. And it was just like any time, Robin, whenever you need, uh, need something or you're unsure, just give me a call. And he has been very helpful. So I can say, give them a call and, and just see when they can come out. And they have always been very helpful to us. Yeah, and I've, and I've also contacted the fire department and right before the pandemic was about to hap happen, we were about to do a DC wide uh, fire extinguisher training for DC cultural heritage sites. So they're, they're very helpful and they're always willing to engage. Um, so one of the questions or one of the comments that was kind of made that I think all of you could kind of mention is, is developing protocols for working together in groups when we come back to work. That is something that should be covered in, in COOP is, you know, the re is having this end game, this end plan of how you go back. Um, so how do you start preparing and planning for coming back into this reopening situation where we were, will be in group environments? Has anyone dealt with that? Thought about it? So all of you realize I live in New York City, right? <laughs> or I used to live in New York City, but my organization is in New York City. And I think while I'm going to say something that might be less popular, just is not the reality that everybody is sharing right now. We're, we're still very much in the thick of things. And I think there is, you need COOP to tell everybody what they're responsible for and what they're not. Because one thing that we're dealing with right now, I think, is... Um, we by nature are you know responsible individuals and we're like well we've got a plan we got a plan we got a plan but right now um the goals and the products of our you know future lives near future lives are not not firm you know we don't know exactly what an exhibition in new york city is going to look like in the near future we don't know what reading room service in the library is exactly going to look at like and we're trying to plan towards that but we we are still in that fluid that fluid timeline where information is changing and um, for certain levels of staff, we have to be aware that, you know, people are going to be planning and they might just be getting exhausted because the information is changing. Um, so I think what helps people avoid that, you know, I'm running the marathon and now I've got a sprint and now I'm out of gas, you know, kind of feeling is being um, very clear about communications through this process and saying like what you're responsible for right now and what we're going to have to wait on. And I think that is um, important for those organizations where, like us, you know, we don't, the horizon is still changing and it's somewhere in August or September or even later. So when we're coming up with these um, COOP plans, what is the process of determining what is a priority when developing them? a loaded question who wants to take it i think first you need to start with your core functions like payroll and access to email and just basic things that are going to keep the organization continuing as an entity and then you can build from there but you have to start with the absolute basics things that you don't even think are essential because you think that they're just ongoing but they need to be deemed essential from the very start Any other opinions? Yeah. 
I, I think I really hit it. Payroll is very central. The the continu you know continuing of the organization. I thought a really handy exercise or scenario to talk through is what if a fire or what if something impacts your ability to handle money. Um, you know, be that the payroll, be that um, receiving checks, be that receiving any donations once people hear of your um, incident at your organization. I think those things really need to be worked out in your coop. And uh, based on some of the comments we're getting in the chat box and some questions is um, coop is a difficult concept to understand. It is not something intuitively we do as cultural institutions, especially from the collection specialist and registrar standpoint. However, you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, FEMA usually suge suggests that you create a general, a general coop as you know, something is affecting your, your business, your operations, your mission. But there are uh, appendices, annexes to your coop that you can specify per emergency, such as a fire, a flood, a pandemic. And you also don't have to start from scratch at to that level that they've actually created a template for you. And um, we've created a resource page that we can share um, that uh, Robin will show me how to share or share with you that um, gives you all these links to this because we don't want you to consider it lost once you leave here. But COOP is different than emergency planning because it doesn't go into that specific detail. It's a wider document that's very general that encompasses everybody at your institution, but you must as collections folks have a seat at the table. And that's what we're trying to do is give you tools here so that you can go back and be like, I must be part of this planning. I must be a, 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 an essential support function. And here is why. And so that being said, I can turn it over to final words from um, all the participants. Anyone want to give a final, final uh, encouraging tool? Goodbye and so forth. It's required. So Becky, we'll start with you. Ooh. Um, let's see. I've been, uh, I graduated from my museum studies program in 1999 with no concept of emergency preparedness at all. I don't know what it was about, like, you know, the blissful late 90s. But um, I didn't see myself as being going to be involved in emergency preparedness or business continuity, coop planning, um, until I heard from my colleagues that, um, you know, we didn't know how to, you know, get involved in emergency preparedness or this happened to us. And um, it, so if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> so I think that's a really important thing to, to keep in mind. Anne? Yeah, I, I think it's important just to, yeah, I mean, doing what you can to, you know, be in the room where it happens and have your voice be heard and raise, raise the red flags, so to speak. Um, you know, I know this was something that, you know, for us, you know, we have our safety committee, we have, you know, a risk register, we have these things. And when we started hearing stuff coming out of China uh, back, you know, in January, and we're sitting there looking at this and I going to our senior leaders and I'm like, I, we need, we need to look at this. And they were like, well, I don't think so. You know, pandemic's really low on our risk register overall. And, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, I don't think this is really gonna, you know, spread that far and, you know, it's bad, but, you know, we're thinking maybe more something on par with like when there was SARS where it affects a number of, you know, places, but not like a real widespread and I wouldn't let go of it um, because I was doing so much research, I was working on it. And so it's that, you know, repeating that message and till you get through um, and really, even if other people are not, are kind of dismissive of it, continue doing your research, continue bringing it up every chance you get <laughs> um, and with different people and raising those concerns. And so that then when, you know, in our case, when, you know, things really started happening here in the United States and, you know, we really had to address it and address it very quickly. At that point, I had, you know, 
a folder's worth and a bunch of notes and files and pages I'd bookmarked that I could quickly go back to and go, these are some things that we need to really start delving into and that I could work with senior leadership. I could work with our safety committee and work with Robin's team and all of the disaster planning and really start moving us into this and start thinking bigger picture um, with all of this to move it forward. Thanks, Ann. Robin, any final words? Yeah, I would say, uh, I would just recommend getting for security anyway, in, in other departments, getting with your security department with collections and registration and custodial too. I just took that over less than a year ago and it getting together and coming to the table and talking about what is important. I think um, our registration department, Angie Day, I just wanna give a shout out to her. She does an excellent job involving security and a lot of the exhibitions, just a lot of things that goes on with the museum. And I think that is what brought us together to be on the same page and like Ann said, with the, the pandemic, it was new for all of us and Ann did a lot of research. And when it was time to go, we were ready because this is something that we have always kind of came to the table and talked about emergency situations. So I just think pulling in these other departments, security, custodial, and having them understand why it's important to keep the collection intact and, and everything clean and safe while everyone's gone uh, it just helps it run a little bit smoother while everyone is out. And that's one less thing that the registration department collection uh, support, you know, have to worry about when they're out because I know they kind of wonder like what's happening while we're not there. But like Ann said, we meet constantly throughout the week. So giving them updates of what's going on and, and they trust what we're doing. So having building that relationship with other departments will, will make emergency response so much smoother and easier. Thank you, Eric. I think going back to what others had said before, I mean, you really need to look at what your core mission is and it's preserving and protecting these collections items in your institution. And if you are forced to relocate, you're forced to not have as many staff on site, you know, what are the core elements that you need to be able to check on remotely? Uh, you know, you may only be have security on site. That's all you may be allowed to have. Are you able to check uh, climate? Are you able to check, uh, you know, uh, security systems, the fire detection systems remotely? Are they still working? Are the vendors that you're working with, are they still around working? Uh, you need to, you know, so that's all this, you know, when you're thinking of continuity and especially what we know now that it can happen on a, a much broader scale than uh, hurricanes or earthquakes or things that we've thought of in the past, uh, you know, sitting down at the tabletop exercises and just throwing out worst case scenarios and, you know, how you're going to be able to maintain uh, basic levels of, of operation going forward. Uh, it's going to be a lot more uh, work for all of us. Thanks. Elena? Um, I would just say um, from a perspective that's definitely informed by living in a disaster prone area uh, where the reality of facing an emergency is very real for six months out of the year, not longer. Um, that disaster preparedness is, is somewhat synonymous with collections protection. So having strong continuity of operations planning and disaster planning in general is just, it's becoming more of an expectation just to be the best stewards that we can be of our collections. Um, and I would just say, if you haven't already, just reach out to your local or state emergency management office and get the conversation started or speak to your neighboring institutions and see what you can do together to help each other weather the storm. Well, thank you to all our panelists. This was really, really helpful and a lot of information to share, I know, in an, in an hour. And we did not get to everyone's questions, but I would really encourage a lot of these questions to go towards the uh, insurance ARCS chat that's happening would be very helpful. But also, Ann and I will be discussing uh, reopening on AAM virtual conference next week. So, you know, we'll, we can answer more of your questions there. But thank you again to all of our panelists. Please also check out the document that Robin posted in the chat box that is, gives you everything you need to know that's possibly available on coup planning. We are here to help. 
And um, thank you all again for joining. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, that next ARCS chat will be happening on May 26 at 1230 Eastern. So you can join us here on our ARCS YouTube channel. Thanks again to all of our speakers, to Becca for moderating, and we'll see you in a few weeks.